you constantly have pressure on you to not make any mistakes, to do well, to work well together. What we are is like one locomotive. Once we get going, they're not going to stop us. I've never felt anything like this until I got here. This is Major League Hardball in a stadium 12 miles up, strapped onto $26 million rockets. Fighter pilots scream across the sky at Mach 2, throwing $200,000 pitches at anything that moves. It's the Air Force's version of uh, who's the best in the sky. It's the Air Force version of Top Gun, a deadly serious game of hot fire missiles, supersonic jets, and gung-ho American pride. You're here, you're trying to be the best of the best, and just the uh, chance to compete in William Tell means a lot. William Tell. It's an every other year military exercise held at Tyndall Air Force Base in the Florida Panhandle. Fighter jet teams from American bases around the world will be gunning for many honors and awards, scrambling to score the most points, to destroy the most planes, to compete in one of the most prestigious events in the military. It's training for war. Training for war. Real jets. Live missiles. Full-fledged aerial combat. A sophisticated war game designed to see who's the best. The top fighter team. The top fighter pilot. The military's top gun. This is one competition where if you come in second, you don't come in at all. Tighten your helmet and fasten your safety belt. For the next 30 minutes, you'll be shooting it out with America's elite. They have gathered here off Florida's Gulf Coast, aiming to prove they're the king of the skies. The U.S. Air Force Top Gun Competition is brought to you by Budweiser. Beechwood aged for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. The night air lingers cool and quiet. Thunder on the flight line begins in just a few hours. Some flight crews have been here all night, inspecting, fine-tuning, and triple-checking spit and polish aircraft before they go to war. On the edge of the Gulf of Mexico, a gathering of supersonic eagles converges onto Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida. Nearly $2 billion worth of Air Force jet fighters have come from bases around the world. From Japan, Germany, Iceland, Canada, Alaska, Florida, New Mexico, Virginia, Texas, New York, Georgia, and Oregon. 12 high-performance teams invited to engage in air-to-air -air combat. To compete, each team must put its aircraft through five patterns or profiles in the sky above the Gulf. In profiles one and two, pilots are required to fire live, radar, and infrared missiles at targets. Targets commonly referred to as drones, old planes which now serve as remote-controlled guinea pigs. Profile 3 involves firing a 20-millimeter gun during limited time frames. In the fourth profile, jet fighters mount aerial defense against a mass bomber and fighter bomber attack. And in Profile 5, air crews scramble against four unidentified target aircraft. There is also ground-based competition for the many support troops. This involves scrambles, missile loads, and hot reloading of aircraft for a quick return to sky combat. They look upon this as, uh, as uh, really a highlight in their professional careers, uh, in whether it happens to be a controller or a, a load crew member or a maintenance um, uh, person on the flight line or the flight crew themselves. Teams of Hawkeye judges scrutinize each and every profile, each and every step, at stake is an overall maximum of 50,000 points and a chance for these highly trained, highly skilled participants to make a name for themselves in this, the most prestigious air-to-air -air combat event found anywhere in the world. We're here to prove that we are the best 
attack the fighter wing. We came down with strictly combat-ready equipment, stuff that could go to war tomorrow, and uh, nothing that you see down here is any fluffier or shinier than we do back at home. We're winners. Why? Because we train, we train, we, we, we won't accept anything less than that. We train 14, 16 hours for three and a half months, and that's what it takes. For two solid weeks, the tension will mount as planes fly and muscles strain in pursuit of top scores. The smell of the hunt hovers in the air, thick as rocket exhaust on the flight line. A dozen teams shooting for first place. More than 50 fighter pilot jocks gunning for the big individual prize, the top gun. You know, you compare yourself with other guys, and sometimes you feel like you do pretty good, but every once in a while you go out there and get humbled by somebody else. So uh, I don't think there's anyone around that can say they every time win every engagement, but if you win the biggest percentage of them, you can probably feel pretty good about yourself. Well, everybody wants to do their best, obviously, and it's just like any other uh, form of competition, uh, race car driving or anything else. Uh, and, of course, this is a very dynamic uh, and fluid environment with uh, very high technology. And for the pilot to go up there and prove his combat skills uh, in front of a worldwide audience uh, is the ultimate test of his abilities. Anytime that I'm killed in peacetime training, I, I feel as though I've been killed, literally. And uh, I think it's seriously like that, and most guys do. Nobody goes out and accepts being defeated. I think if we did, then uh, we would be with, for the worse. You don't spend a minimum of five intense years studying to be a pilot without thinking you're someone special, one of the chosen few. According to the Air Force, by the time a raw recruit goes through training and becomes a full-fledged fighter pilot, sub six million dollars has been spent on his development. Six million dollars. When we come home at night, then uh, my wife often has to whisper in my ear that I'm just a man. The $6 million man meets the $26 million machine. That's the story when Air Force fighter pilots get behind the wheel of the F-15. A high-tech, state-of-the-art, quick-as-a-bullet jet fighter that can turn on the edge of a dime at twice the speed of sound. The F-15 is the predominant plane at William Tell this year. You are looking at a lifelike simulation of what happens when these top planes and these top pilots join forces and go to war. Man and machine expressing artistic anger in the sky. Everything is time compressed, literally. We are in an engagement two uh, fighter pilots against each other, both flying at the speed of sound, that's a closure of 20 miles a minute. So that's, the, the miles are just clicking off. And you have, that's a number of seconds per mile that you have to deal with and make your decisions. And the real challenge for the fighter pilot is to be able to stay ahead of his jet. Right now, I come back to the south here, we got one pressure from the south. Yeah, I got the right on there. Keeping planes and pilots at their competitive best is a large part of what William Tell 88 is all about. Off the Gulf Coast of Florida, that competition is very much alive. So is camaraderie, as troops and teams representing the best of the Air Force engage in an old-fashioned shootout. At stake is something soldiers and civilians alike identify with, a word called pride. Let's go, baby. After several days of competition, the emotion reaches a feverish pitch at this Super Bowl of military combat. This year's William Tell features some of the toughest competition in recent memory. Almost a half dozen teams are in the thick of the chase for the overall prize. An even tougher call is who will win the Top Gun Award. At this point, it's almost anyone's guess. Daily updates at the massive William Tell scoreboard indicate which team, which pilot has the hot hand. Those looking strong include 
the 36th tactical fighter wing from Bitburg Air Base in Germany. The guys from Holloman, New Mexico, the Fighting 49ers. And the one team most people are quietly picking as the group to beat, a confident, well-drilled bunch from Florida's Eglin Air Force Base. Right now, I'd say Eglin is certainly a clear favorite to win. They've got uh, very high scores, both on uh, the gun profile, profile four, the mass raid, and profile five, the air defense uh, scramble scenario. Uh, they've only got missiles left to shoot, and they shot some this morning. They killed a drone with one of their uh, radar missiles, uh, and the rest of their missiles, uh, I think, look pretty good. So I think they've got a good shot. In the race for the top individual award, the Top Gun, the lead amongst these highly skilled pilots changes hands as often as an F-15 on the prowl. You feel the tension build as we got here. The tension wasn't as heavy, and now as the scores have started to come out, the tension is building, and each pilot's getting a little more tense, and we'll all be glad when it's over, but we're all going to hope that it, when it's over that we're the winners. Seven, six and a half. Five and a half. Should be Foxen now. Five. Fox, Fox, Fox. What has somewhat surprised judges and spectators alike here is the dramatic increase in the number of drone kills. A total of two were destroyed at the last William Tell in 1986. But by the time the final missile is fired this year, ten drones will go up in flames. The judge's computerized radar tracking screen can barely keep up with the path of destruction. The uncanny accuracy displayed by this year's Top Gun hopefuls, America's best air-to-air -air gunslingers. Today, we'll go out there, get those three airplanes ready, get them out, come up to the auditorium, and let's watch them shoot those drones. This is the crew from Eglin Air Force Base, they're deep in the hunt for William Tell gold and glory. After four profiles, they find themselves leading the competition. The, the pride of the 33rd is, it's, it's unbelievable. It, it's, uh, you come here with a feeling that uh, people have, are in the hunt after you. That you set the standards and that's what this team is doing. We're setting standards out here. There's no doubt in anyone's mind that we've set the pace for this competition for quite a few years. And we continue to set the pace. That board shows what we can do, and we know in our hearts what we can do. I'm proud of you. You should be proud of yourselves. You've done a good job. At this point in the competition, the Eglin team can stand tall, feel proud. More than halfway through the tournament, it is at the top of the standings. More importantly, this is the unit that other teams watch, the only team to ever win William Tell twice, with back-to-back -back victories in 84 and 86. Eglin has developed a taste for victory. Number three would call for a feast. When we're closely knit, there's an esprit de corps that cannot be compared. Everybody is helping everybody else out. The pilots, everybody wants the other pilot to do just as well as he's doing. And we're all trying to do our personal bests every second of every sortie. We uh, have standards that we've developed on our own by virtue of the practices we've had. We know what we're capable of. We weren't flying against any other particular team here. We were flying against those standards. And if we meet or exceed those standards, then uh, we've done the best we can. If they can catch us and beat us, then they're a better team than we are. Most important on this particular logo are the two small apples with the years 1984 and 1986. Eglin is the first unit to ever win William Tell back to back. And that's what we're showing our wins in both 84 and 86. I see you've got room up there for a third apple. We've left room for a third apple, and we're in contention this year. And we're hoping that uh, when we come back in 1990, we'll have three apples on there, 84, 86, and 88. Three apples, three consecutive William Tell championships. If the nomads of Eglin are to add yet another symbolic victory apple to their team logo, they must first score well on their last remaining profile. Teams from Bitburg and Holloman are right on their tail. And with just a few days left, the pressure and tension grips each and every competitor. The most intense pressure I've ever been under in my 14 and a half years in the Air Force, uh, bar none. Uh, and I've 
including pilot training and RTU and fighter weapon school, uh, this, this was absolutely the most intense. At this stage of the competition, no one feels that intensity more than Eglin pilot Scott Fasholz. His team's hopes for a possible third consecutive championship rest squarely on his shoulders as he prepares for Eglin's final flight. Softball. That's prop 20 look now. Growing tension is understandable when you're trying to gain points and win titles by blasting remote-controlled QF-100 drones out of the sky. It's a game of aerial cat and mouse, one pitting experienced drone operators against top fighter teams. What you are watching is video of various teams on the hunt, highlights from actual competition during profiles one and two. The voices you will hear belong to fighter pilots and their teams, and occasionally Air Force Captain Dale Faust describing the seek and destroy mission for military television. Fox, Fox, Fox. Aces 1-1, one, one, knock it off. Tail gun 0-1, knock it off, arm safe. Fox, Fox, Fox. 7-2, tally who engaged. Turn the drone. Drone is turning. Tail gun 2, clear the fire. Aces 1-1, one, one, knock it off. Tail gun 2, knock it off, arm safe. Engine copies, knock it off, arm safe. Shogun 2, post attack 360. Shogun 2, heading 360. Fox, Fox, Fox. Hit. Aces 1, knock it off. And Rhino 5, knock it off, weapon safe. Rhino 5, knock it off, post attack 080. Rhino 05, chick 100-15 and a right hand turn at Angels 2-1. Rhino 05, we're radar contact there. Oh, Mike, you're out of control. Video. Time to blow it up. Clear the drone. Drone is clear. I got it. Roll right there. Keep the VSD on. I know two, 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 nine, zero, 12, tracking east, angles one nine. Eight, two, one, mark. Got it. Good secondary. Keep going, Chick. Keep going. Here's the missile that will be fired by Captain Nelson and AIM 9P. This missile has a warhead on board. So that the uh, QF-100 will be destroyed. We're going to see the uh, missile come off the rail, and we'll pick up the uh, live shot as the missile is employed. There she goes. There's the uh, miss missile en route and smack on the drone. Okay, Mike, looks like you're still flying. Three, two, one, mark. And there's a secondary explosion. Okay, yeah, good to strike, Mike. And I guess we can say that. Uh, one more QF-100 bites the dust. The destruction at William Tell takes on record proportions, but it's not over yet. Back on the ground, pilots plot for more, reviewing strategy in quiet briefing rooms away from the noise and battle. Three teams, Bitburg, Eglin, and Holloman, rank close to the top in the closing hours of William Tell 88. The pressure on Eglin is heaviest, the two-time defending champs are just a short flight away from long-remembered glory. Both team and individuals are faring well. 33rd tactical fight away with 9,100 points. This is the one we need. Eglin's hopes and dreams for the overall team title ride with Captain Scott Fasholz. On one remaining flight, Fasholz and his squad are a single missile away from possible victory. After four months of constant practice, it has come down to this. For me, I, I flew it in 86, and the pressure is more, a little bit more this year than it was then, I think, just because of where I'm standing right now. Then you get up in the airplane, and you sit there for about five minutes. Now's the time to kind of hopefully sit there and kind of relax and uh, go through the mission in your mind again with uh, really not too much going on. Just wait for the, get to the right time, go ahead and start. And then if I got any time, make sure the wingman and who's ever flying with me is all ready to go. And, and uh, any other time you got, you're still going through your mind what's going to happen when you got in the area, what, uh, you know, what the required communications calls are, what the setup's probably going to be like. 
where the sun might be in case it's going to be a factor for uh, taking a heat shot. Like the scream of hot jet engines, the pressure surrounds him, relieved only by the send-off of his close-knit crew. Thumbs and emotions are raised for their man at the stick as the 33rd Tactical Fighter Wing is now running on high-octane pride. In a room away from the flight line, the Eglin crew and pilots watch. Suddenly, their expectations crash in flames. Fashold's fires, but the missile tucked under the wing won't budge. Okay, so, I go. so when you engage the target, it, it got weird on you? Well, when I engaged him, I rolled out, and it didn't sound like a very quality tone. Yeah. And so I didn't shoot it then. And I went around, backed off, and came back and pointed at him again to take it. And this time, it had uh, no, no self-track capability at all. So I figured if it was going to do anything, it was going to go after a shark, and I'd just bring it home. And... Yeah, we'll check it out. If the missile malfunction, the judges will allow a refly. If the missile checks out, Eglin is out of the running and a third straight title out of the question. Uh, we've, we've uh, I'm not gonna, it's gonna be disappointing, you know, not to win it when we've, uh, we're looking like we have a very good opportunity now because of uh, maybe one profile, but I don't think we're gonna be upset or anything like that. We can be real proud of what we've done so far. While judges determine the course of a single reluctant missile, Eglin's pilots, crew, and visiting families will try to relax until the verdict is in one of the most important decisions in this year's competition. Final score posting for the U.S. Air Force's worldwide air-to-air -air weapons meet, William Tell, 1988. Two weeks of intensity melt into an outpouring of emotion at the final posting of scores. For the more than 1,500 Air Force participants, it's over. The last missiles have been loaded. The last fighter planes sent on the prowl. The final rockets fired. Eglin's unfortunate missile problem proves most costly. Judges rule that Captain Fashholtz's missile was operational, pointing to aircraft or pilot as potential sources of error. No points for Fashholtz's flight. The Nomads finish a disappointing sixth. I don't need to tell you that the 49th... The big winners came blazing from the desert of New Mexico. Scoring almost 40,000 out of a possible 50,000 points, Holloman Air Force Base bags the top team prize and bragging rights to air superiority for the next two years. Uh, we're ecstatic, we really are, and uh, the people back home are ecstatic. A lot of people have put a lot of long, hard hours into this, and uh, it's paid off for them. He's not an actor, not a movie star. Captain Ted Varig aced three of his five profiles, helping his Holloman teammates to victory, and also earning for himself one of the military's most prestigious awards, Top Gun. To win the Top Gun is just uh, a little bit of extra gravy. Kind of, it builds some more pride in the unit. Uh, the crew chiefs are uh, all real happy for me for this, and. Uh, the looks on their faces made it all worthwhile. Just to be able to show, yeah, we got some guys who can do well down here and fly with the best of them. Fly with the best of them. For two weeks, these top fighter pilot teams did just that. Pushing, straining, competing for a host of coveted awards. Soaring to new heights in a military exercise with far greater implications than simply choosing winners and losers. Fortunately, all the teams in this competition are all uh, on the same side. And when we go to war tomorrow or next year or in five years, we're all going to be fighting for the same cause, and that's the American freedom and the democratic process. The U.S. Air Force Top Gun competition has been brought to you by Budweiser. Beechwood aged for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. This has been a presentation of Bud Sports through the facilities of ESPN.